Hello everybody, how are you guys? It's time for another Detroit history lesson. <laughs> and guys, in this case, we're going to go through some of the prominent suburbs in Detroit and we're going to talk briefly about how they started and their general history to again and give you an idea of how the suburbs grew as the city did. Now the first one on our list is Palmer Woods. Palmer Woods was started in the very early days of Detroit and it was the great grandparents great great maybe even we're not we're not really sure historians aren't sure uh, of Arnold Palmer the famous golfer and of course the Palmers were from Pennsylvania but back in the day some of the family branched out to Detroit and the reason being is that in Pennsylvania you've got a problem where it's extremely hilly and if you couldn't hit a five iron uh, over the hill into the green, uh, let's say your normal five iron is 175 yards, or no, let's say your normal five iron is five, yeah, 100, 170 yards, 170 yards. <laughs> uh, then when you're hitting over so many hills and you have so many side hill lies in Pennsylvania, I, it gets frustrating and some of those golfers of the famous Palmer golfing family moved on to Detroit I'm guessing mid 1800s maybe maybe mid 1700s and uh, established Palmer Woods now the original idea was that there would be a golf course with that same name uh, in the center of town and that the town would be built up around it. So that if you bought a property in that uh, suburb, you'd automatically belong to the club. Now, Detroit isn't nearly as hilly as Pennsylvania, so this is a big hit right away. And a lot of times people would drive their golf carts uh, to the mall and back, but in the early days, they didn't have malls or golf courses carts so people would throw their clubs in the back of an ox cart and the caddies would both drive the ox cart as well as advise on club selection so now Palmer Woods pretty well recognized as one of the more prominent suburbs in Detroit and of course with that illustrative history there's a complete understanding why so the number two suburb that we want to look at is the Marina District. Now the Marina District was originally a, as we mentioned in our early days of Detroit uh, video, it was built by beavers. It was a beaver dam, and it came. It became a marina for uh, wealthy patrons later when they would pull up their boats and basically what would happen is the beavers would build their dams you know right alongside the boats in other words they'd block them in so you'd pull your boat up and then these beavers would get to work working on their dams and then you come back from lunch and you can't leave and we had people sailing up and down the great lakes trying to eat lunch in Detroit and they couldn't get home and in fact sometimes they were delayed so much that people's spouses spouses would uh, notify the officials that they were they were missing and they were never seen again so they would remarry and tragically the same thing would happen in the next generation sometimes people would sail to Detroit beavers would block them in the beavers didn't know because again when you're talking about the frontier the beginnings of Detroit it was all woods all of Michigan was one big forest now that's not so much the case now of course there's still plenty of it left but 
you couldn't you couldn't go seven feet in Michigan in the 1700s without bumping into a tree and the forest was so valued that you had to apologize to the tree you say I'm sorry won't happen again but you knew it was going to happen again all you could plan for was that it would be a different tree all right guys number three on the list is Indian Village and then of course the Native Americans were a big part of the area for many years still are and as we mentioned in the early days of Detroit uh, audio uh, you know at the beginning there was only like 30 or 40 people in the entire town so Indian Village was just that it was now it's a suburb but in the early days it was just a part of the community so you had settlers that you know built cabins and then in village of course they worked with teepees different different structures depending on the culture but everybody worked together and every friday night there was a dance and uh, quite a bit of hooch uh, was consumed by all by all people and they dance around and uh so Indian Village was connected to Detroit from the very, very beginning. And now, of course, it's really one of the more prestigious uh, suburbs in the area. And they still, they still have hoot nannies on Friday nights over there in Indian Village. And, you know, you don't have to live in the community to participate. You can come in. Now, if you come in, you can't get crazy like you can have fun you want they want you to go to the restaurants to the shops but you can't get crazy if you get crazy guys uh they're gonna um ask that you never come back or that at least you go to ann arbor where that kind of a thing is expected the next one on our list is sherwood forest now sherwood forest is one of the more storied communities in the Detroit area. And it's also one of the more, more mysterious because Sherwood Forest has a lot of uh, prominent uh, Detroit families that live there. And the original Sherwoods that established the, the suburb, they have um, a long, long history in the city and sometimes there'd be one member of the family that uh, would branch off and a lot of the a lot of the other family members are like what are you doing what we're, we're, we're trying to run a town here a suburb and you're off uh, doing some kind of mystical uh, conjuring are you trying to be a magician or are you starting a new uh, sort of a pagan rituals or, or what's happening over here and sometimes because the namesake of the community came from the force of england right so it also then would retain some of those magical mystical traits that were prominent back in the sherwood forest of old so it's not just that robin hood was running around trying to level out the playing field of the income inequality of the time that was one thing but beyond that you had ogres and witches you had warlocks all roaming around in the sherwood forest of old so when they started the new one in detroit in the as a detroit suburb this particular and not, not just this one but several family members of the sherwood uh, family would say listen we need to duplicate it the way it was we can't just have a boring suburb that doesn't have witches and warlocks so that's why they took those steps to bring it up to date uh, and then retain some of that magic of old now is every was everybody on board with that no one no one was on board with that none of the family wanted to retain the magical mystical qualities of old are you nuts 
we're trying to sell homes here, they said. We're trying to build this community. We can't have warlocks on the corner casting spells. We can't have witches picking people up with their powers and dropping them from a height of seven, eight feet in the air. And they fall to the ground and sue us. Are you crazy? So there was a lot of uh, drama in the early days. But now, of course, you look around and you go, this is not a boring suburb. This is an exciting place where people want to live. Now, the next one on our list is Corktown. Corktown is really the heartwarming story of people drinking beer at hockey games in Detroit. Now, what do I mean? Well, that seems kind of uh, hard to believe, right? How come it's a heartwarming story? Well, remember that hockey was part of Detroit from the very early days. They would play on the river between Windsor and Detroit. They'd play out there and it would freeze every year. Now, sometimes they would shoot the puck at the net it, because everything was frozen, including Lake Erie. The puck would go all the way across the ice to Cleveland, to Toledo maybe, but sometimes to Cleveland. And they'd send out the younger kids, you know, that had more stamina and weren't drunk to go get that puck in Cleveland. And of course, what happened then is some of those younger folks turning 17, 18, they'd come of age and they'd say, I'm just staying in Cleveland. I'm just staying in Cleveland. I'm going to raise my brood here. And then and that's what they would do, start a family in Cleveland. But the, the, the marriage between hockey and some good brewskis uh, goes way, way back to the beginning of the Americas uh, in Boston. And so when some of those Bostonites lit out for, remember, it was the frontier in those days, guys. Remember, that was the Wild West. Detroit was considered what later San Francisco might have been considered, right? It, as some Western goal that as pioneers we have to reach. So this is in the days when they actually had to build your own hockey skates. There wasn't like a, a hockey skate manufacturer where you could go down and pick out a pair. You had to cast, you had to build the boot, okay, out of buckskin, and then you had to build the blade. You'd have to hammer the blade uh, just using the campfire and uh, some metal that you found on the ground with your metal detector. So the Corktown area was the was the first uh, American uh, city or suburb or municipality, we could say, that actually used corks in their brews. So you had probably 75 different breweries at the time, uh, and maybe I'd say 40, 45 of them were using corks. And of course, now you don't see that at all. It's usually just wine that uh, are using corks. But remember, they didn't, uh, a lot of the, the refinements that you see in the beverage industry today, nobody, nobody knew those at the time. They were experimenting. It was uh, an innovator's delight out there on the frontier. So corks just seemed like a better way to maintain the freshness of the beers and also to prevent uh, snakes from crawling into the glass, into the uh, bottle and uh, surprising you once you pop the cork. Now, the freshness angle didn't turn out to be such of a problem because once it was manufactured, the early settlers of Detroit and of course of Corktown would consume those beers in probably like 20 minutes. So freshness wasn't a problem because the product was consumed so fast. Uh, so that's the history of Corktown. And again, today it's kind of a hip place to live. So if you're kind of a hipster, if you have skinny jeans, if you uh, drive a moped around, or maybe you have a, a fixie bike, 
then um, that's maybe where you live. All right, next one on our list is Detroit Golf. And this isn't golf as in G-U-L-F, like a body of water. That's what a lot of people think that don't live in the Detroit area. This is golf as in hitting a white ball or these days a possibly a purple ball uh, with various sticks around a course. But it began as a competitor to Palmer Woods. Uh, but Palmer Woods was the first and the more popular. So what did they do differently? They said, all right, so Palmer Woods, and again, we're looking at like 1760, 1770, right in there. So Detroit Golf said, all right, we need to be the younger, cooler uh, golf uh, subdivision, right, or suburb. And because Palmer Woods got there first and got that prestige of the Palmer family name, they said, all right, let's do this. We're going to be younger. We're going to be hipper. And they came out with some cool hats, right, that were not your standard golf caps. They actually had LED mini bulbs on them that uh, would light up at night, okay? So if you had an early tea time um, before the sun came up, uh, you could impress your friends with your LED mini bulb golf cap. And then, this is really innovative, they came out with the same thing with your name, or if you wanted to be stuffy about it, your initials on your golf shirt in LED uh, mini bulbs. And then that way, if not only, not only could you impress your friends, uh, because it would, when you play the music on your phone, it would uh, vibrate and change colors to the music. But there was an added bonus too, because a lot of these golfers, these younger golfers, I mean, they'd be hitting that tequila at like 4.30 in the morning for a 5 o'clock tea time. And so sometimes they'd get lost out there on the third or fourth hole. They'd hit a ball in the woods, and then they, they couldn't be found. They, were, they had so many shots, they couldn't find their way back to the fairway. Well, they, first of all, they couldn't find the fairway in the first place. But then when they went to find their ball, they were, got lost. And so the mini bulb, the LED lights on their hats and on their shirts uh, allowed their buddies to find them and just go, yeah, we're over here, we're over here, a uh, little, little to your left, a little to your right. And this guy's stumbling around, crashing through the woods, uh, trying to find his way back to the uh, fairway. And, and so that's what you have today. You have a cooler hipper community uh, that all play golf. So the history of hockey and golf connected to Detroit goes so far back, guys, it's, it's hard to unwind them from each other. But if you do play golf, you have a number of suburbs to choose from. And in fact, in Detroit golf, they have some public parks where you can practice your swing and what they've done is made it uh, friendly to the environment because they have you out there whacking weeds. So if you want to like practice your swing without hitting a ball, you just want to loosen up, maybe walk over to the park with a seven iron, they'll say, okay, Ted, just go right over there and they put you in a weed patch and you're swinging away at all these weeds. And it's good for the park system because it saves labor and it's good for the taxpayer as well because they save money. We don't know, there is no data on if it actually helps the golfer, right? Because most golfers are terrible and will never get any better. The next one on our list is Rivertown. And Rivertown is really what Detroit is all about. If there was a heart and soul of the suburbs of Detroit, it would be Rivertown. Because a lot of people think of Detroit as a lake town, being part of the Great Lake system. But really, Detroit, when you think about it, is a river town. The floating barges, the wide waterways, the indescribable excitement of catching a mud bass on a line that you 
hooked with bologna, some salami, and the end of your baguette into the water. The lazy summer days, sitting on the banks, looking across at Canada, and going, if only, if only we had a country that was as big as Canada and as big as their hearts. So it's, it's a feeling of freedom, a feeling of openness, a feeling of friendliness, and a real love of your neighbor's um, commitment to beer manufacturing in the form of Molson and Labatt's Brewing Companies. So Rivertown is what a lot of people, when they look at the suburbs, they think of this as the most Detroitish suburb because of its name, primarily. And then, of course, all of the residents reflect that commitment to friendliness, to openness. And if you walk through Rivertown and you just say, hey, hey, brother, how you doing? Hey, man. Hey, miss. Hey, hey sister. And they'll just bring it right back at you. You're like, how's it going, buddy? What's going on, man? Is there anything you need? I just say, yeah, I, I could use a brewski. And they're like, hey, we're going to take you right over the right over the waterway there to Canada. We're going to get a little bats for you. They'll, they'll take care of you. They'll drive you over there. And you'll probably have to take an Uber back. But it's the kind of friendliness that Rivertown is known for. And a lot, what a lot of people think of as the real center of Detroit uh, in terms of how close it is to the city in terms of spirit. Now, the next one on our list, guys, is Medical Center. Medical Center, how do we describe it? In 1770s, 1780s, um, when you had, what, 30, 40, maybe by 1780, you had 100, 200 people in Detroit, right? So not that many. But you had a lot of wildlife. And people get injured when they're out there on the frontier, out there on the, you know, when you're, when you're knocking down trees to build a house, there's going to be some accidents. So the original medical center was just a log cabin, really. And they'd bring you in there. Uh, let's say you cut off a finger chopping down a tree trying to build your house. So you bring the finger in with you and they'd lay you down on the uh it wasn't even really a bed it was like a, a log that they'd uh, plane down so you just laid on this uh, flat part of a uh half of half a half a log really and uh they'd say what can we do for you and you'd hand them the finger and say hey man can you reattach this and the guy, and the guy's like yeah um well how long ago did it happen? And you say, ah, uh, it happened this morning and I threw it in some ice, but I was so busy, I just didn't have time to tend to it till now. And the doctor's like, well, it's four o'clock. Yeah, looks like this finger's been unattached for seven, eight hours. Uh, I, so I don't know, but I'll do my best. And you're like, yeah, do your best. And uh, they would put a uh, mixture of, um, uh, possum smell into a cloth and put it over your mouth and so that mixture of possum and bat uh, aromas will put you to sleep and in this case the guy woke up an hour later and his fingers reattached he said doc that's pretty good how did you do that and uh, the doctor said hey listen um, you don't want to know uh, so to this day, we're not even sure of those early surgical procedures, but that's really the center of medical center and how it all started was those frontier medical procedures, the, uh, the different um, medicines that they just invented on the spot. Uh, you walk into the medical center, hey, man, doc, I've had this headache for months. I just can't get rid of it. And the doctor would look out the window and he'd go, uh, you, need to, you need to drink some water uh, that, that came from uh, that beaver dam over there. 
Yeah, the water that is filtered through the Beaver Dam. And you're like, you're like, sure. And, you know, they didn't know. They had no clue. Uh, now, did everybody get cured from these spontaneous uh, medical uh, ideas and and medicines? Uh, no. In fact, some of them, you know, would just collapse right there and they couldn't revive them. But these are the th kinds of things that are necessary when you're advancing a community as fast as they were in the early days of Detroit. The next one on our list is Green Acres. Now, a lot of people are uh, poo-pooing uh, California these days. They say, it's like George Carlin used to say, oh, uh, what aren't fruits and nuts in California are flakes. It's like a bowl of cereal. Okay, well, all right, George, we heard it. We heard the jokes, we get it. But Green Acres was started by the same company that produced the Green Acres TV show. And the question in a lot of people's mind is, well, what do you mean? They don't even really have movies or any kind of that stuff uh, in 1775, did they? No, but it started out as a stage play. This is what people don't understand. What, what, what else is there to do on the frontier in Detroit? You go to the play. They, it wasn't Shakespeare, okay. But it was a play for the people. How many people do you think were literate in 1775 on the frontiers of Detroit? Nah, maybe one person. And the only reason she was literate was because she came from Boston. And at that time, half of Boston could read and write. Now, most of what they wrote were various uh, swear words because that's how they figured that people would retain information is if they put it in a written form of a Boston accent so they would stick to their brain but nonetheless um, verbal entertainment was very common and so like I said there was what 100 200 people in the community at that time and they'd have tryouts for the community theater. Somebody would go for a part, a lead. They wouldn't get it. And they'd get upset. They'd get mad. And, the, you know, the drama would, would begin. And not just the drama on the stage, but as everybody in theater knows, most of the drama is backstage from the big egos trying to compete for who gets the most lines but that show started a tour around Michigan and the Upper Peninsula and sometimes they'd be up in the UP putting on this show called Green Acres there'd be like two people in the audience but hey when you are from the UP and anybody comes around and says we're putting on a show I mean, first of all, you're just glad to see anybody at all. Like, in the early days of the UP, and sometimes even today, you were happy to see a bear. I mean, you were happy to see any living thing. Because it was so expansive and so remote that even moose didn't want to go back in there. Because it was just too lonely. I remember reading an old newspaper account of an interview with a moose. And they said to the moose, why don't you, why don't you roam around more in the UP? And the moose is like, you can, there's no one to talk to. You can't put on your earbuds. It's against the law. All these uh, woke environmentalists won't even let you put in your earbuds. And uh, the interviewer said, now come on, there's bears, there's birds up there. And the moose said, where? <laughs> I mean, maybe for two weeks a year. Uh, and so when the humans heard that there was a traveling show called Green Acres coming around, they, they would they'd dance for joy. And not only would they sit up front, they'd sit on the stage uh, with their eyes wide open and just laughing at every line. I mean, the best audience you'd ever want, right, as a performer. And the reviews, the reviews were fantastic. 
and they, they, I mean the the bar for success in the UP and in some of the remote areas of the of the uh, main part of Michigan were, were outstanding for Green Acres so much so that once Hollywood developed they needed ideas and really if you could even just make a decent pitch you were going to sell your, your show to Hollywood and that's how Green Acres became such a monster hit I think on CBS actually uh, but it all started in the suburb of Green Acres well guys this is just a thumbnail sketch of these suburbs there's so much more going on there we didn't even really scratch the surface if you have information that you know that can help people that are potentially traveling to Detroit maybe even moving to Detroit and they want information on these areas and you're a local you're knowledgeable hey share that information because when you do you help lift the community as we rise arm in arm together talk to you soon